So as an occupational therapist, um, I'm trained in sensory processing and you might have heard the term sensory processing or perhaps even sensory integration. And the day and or maybe the months or the years when I discovered what sensory processing is um, and how it relates to us um, was one of those aha moments. So I'm hoping that um, today I'll be able to share some of my knowledge and some of my experience with you so that you would also have a aha moment, um, not only on a personal level, but also as a parent, as a caregiver, as a teacher, and whichever capacity you are relating to others and the environment. Sensory experiences are part of everything we are and everything we do every day. It's the basis of learning and it's this multi-sensory processing and the integration of the senses that creates a depth of experience. Every sensation has a slight different meaning to each of us, depending on how your brain interprets the input. We call that your unique sensory threshold. This is the reason why you might feel cold and put a sweater on when no one else around you seems to feel the cold. Or why you can't stand going on a roller coaster ride and your partner loves it. There's five senses that you might be well aware of and those systems gives us information about the world around us. And these are the senses that we all learn about when we're in school. Your visual system, your eyes, your ears, your taste, your smell and your touch. And let's quickly just discuss how important um, these senses are because we underestimate and we just take it for granted often in the sensory ritual that we're living in. And we need to remember that our children's sensory systems are very much um, still maturing um, and at different points throughout their um, developing years that you might see that suddenly they're touching things more that they used to touch or suddenly they're becoming more avoidant or more irritated by sounds and that might just be an indication that the, that system is working hard, that system is developing and that system is maturing. So just looking at those systems um, briefly, first of all the visual system. The visual sense does far more than merely seeing. It works closely with the other systems and allow us to develop what we call visual spatial perception. We cannot move through space if we have visual spatial difficulties, if we don't know where our body is in space. And this can be a frightening world for the child to live in. And we often see children with visual spatial perception difficulties doing these type of behaviors. They might lie on the floor and that would be the place where they would prefer to play and play with their Lego or play with their blocks or play with their cars. And that could be an indication of the child's difficulties to keep his posture up against gravity and to orientate his posture and his visual perception. And it's often for them easier to be closer and nearer to the object that they're playing with. And in a means to get there, they would place themselves on the floor. We also see that children often line up objects, and that could be an indication of the child finding it difficult um, with visual spatial orientation. For example, if that child is out of his visual field, they do not know how to locate it. So it's easier for them to line it up and to have it in a visual place where it's very consistent. We might also see that the child might get stuck in a specific role and in a specific game and they always want to play games in the same manner and in the same way and they find it difficult to involve other children in their play because remember with other children and other objects that come into their space they have to use their visual spatial perception um, to make the other person and the other objects part of their play. If these are some of the behaviours that, um, that you notice in your child, be aware that it could just be a developmental phase that your child is going through um, and it might not be an indicator of sensory processing difficulties. But as we go through the sensory systems, you might see that there will be more than one behaviour that your child is displaying. And that could be the time when you might want to seek some help, talk to the teacher, go and talk to the paediatrician um, or go and seek some help from an occupational therapist who is qualified in sensory processing. 
The next system I'd like to talk about is the auditory system. The auditory system is located in the inner ear and again it's doing much more than just allowing us to hear what's going on around us. It has close connections with the movement system and also with the visual system and those three systems work together for the child to be able to develop and to play and to learn. The olfactory system um, is the system that allows us to smell. Again, this system is important in keeping us safe and it will alert us to harmful smells around us. It might be interesting for you to know that the olfactory system is one of the systems that develops rapidly until the age of 12. This system is also important when it comes to self-regulation because when a child finds the smells coming from your kitchen unpleasant, it might put them in a place where they are dysregulated. And then there's the gustatory system, the system that allows you to taste that hamburger and chips. And we know that this, that system also works very closely with the um, olfactory system. These systems are all very complex. They keep us safe and above all, they give meaning to life. Um, and in the sensory world that we live in. Then there's three other sensory systems that I'd like to tell you about. And those systems give us information about what's going on inside our bodies. The first is the vestibular system. That system is located in the inner ear and it's like the GPS of your body. It tells you where you are in space, whether you're moving up or down or forward, whether you're upside down or whether the world is upside down. It provides very important information to keep us up against gravity and it coordinates the two sides of the body and to develop a balance. It's also a system that's important when it comes to the function and the skill of self-regulation. We all know that movement is one of the key elements in self-regulation. We feel better when we move. Not only are the feel-good hormones released when we move, but we also stimulate the vestibular system, the movement system. And all of that information keeps us alert and attentive and helps us with this skill called self-regulation. The second system that I'd like to discuss today is the proprioceptive system. That system is located in the muscles and in the joints. And every time when we move, especially when we do movements against gravity, that system is activated. When it comes to the proprioceptive system, as parents and educators, we have to keep in mind that our daily activities that we're involved in don't always allow for proprioceptive activation. That means we don't intentionally um, pick up heavy objects. And if we're not intentional about giving our children opportunities to hang, to pull, to push, then we are not activating the proprioceptive system. It gives us a sense of where our body is in space. And this system is crucial, especially when we are taking vision um, out of the equation. It gives you the, the ability to tie the bow behind your back when you're putting your apron on. It gives you that ability to take your pencil in your hand without looking where your pencil is. And it gives you the ability to hold that pencil with the right amount of grip. We see that children that struggle with proprioceptive awareness and processing either hold their pencil too tightly or too loose. They might give you a very tight hug or they might just give you a hug that can't even be called a hug. We see these children plomping up the steps or crashing into objects um, like tables and chairs around them because they do not know where their bodies start and where it ends and how it relates to the environment that they learn and that, that they function in. Examples of activities that you can include and you have to be intentional about including into your child and your own daily life are things like wheelbarrow walking, opportunities to cycle, cycle to school, cycle around the block, activities where they can push and pull heavy objects. So take a box and fill it with books or fill it with toys and ask them to move it around from the one room to the other room.
be intentional um, about including movement activities before school, after school, um, and tonight before you go to bed. It's activating that deep muscles that is activating the proprioceptive system. And last but not least is the introceptive system. That system is located in the internal organs like the heart and the bladder and the bowels. This system works closely with, with the vestibular and the proprioceptive system and determine how an individual perceives their body. I have seen children who become very dysregulated when their heart is beating fast. I've seen children who find it difficult to regulate their bladder um, and their bowel movements. I've also seen children who we have to remind to put on their sweater or to take off their sweater because they just don't seem to feel when their body is cold or when it's hot. We often have to remind children with interoceptive problems to drink a glass of water or to eat because they just don't seem to feel or they just don't have the urge to take a glass of water and to have a meal. Introception is a difficult system to address per se. Um, we cannot do activities necessarily for the bladder and the bowel and um, the heart. But what we see with this system is that it's closely associated with the proprioceptive system. And once we get the proprioceptive system activated, once we get our children to know, to have an internal sense of where their body is and, and how it relates to the world around them, um, then we often see improvements in their ability to self-regulate um, the introceptive system. So now that we know that the brain is bombarded with lots of sensory information from outside of the body and from inside, it's important to recognize and to realize that none of these sensory systems work in isolation. Sensory processing refers to the brain's ability to receive the sensory information, whether that's from the visual system, the auditory system, the movement system or the proprioceptive system, to then take that information up into the brain, to organize it, to filter it, so that we can have an appropriate behavior. It's important, specifically the filtering process as well, because if we are aware of every single sensory stimulation around us, like for instance, the seam on your sock, the watch on your arm, the humming of the aircon in the background, if that stimulation isn't filtered, our brains will be overloaded and we won't be able to attend to the task at hand. If sensory processing is working well, it's like driving on a well-maintained highway. The info just goes into the brain, it's processed and an appropriate response or a behavior is elicited. However, if the processing is not working well, um, it might cause what we call a traffic jam in the brain. Some of the information might be processed and others might not be successfully processed. That can have an effect on the child's behavior, on his development and on his functioning in general. If you as a parent or a caregiver or an educator are concerned that your child has got difficulties with any areas of sensory processing, I would advise you to seek help. We know that early intervention is key and that the traffic jam that is caused by sensory processing difficulties is something that could be rectified. There is hope. The brain can change and the way that the brain is processing can change.